Welcome to the Institute of Catholic Culture, a nonprofit Catholic organization dedicated to the re-evangelization of our society through educational and cultural programs offered to the public at no charge. This and other presentations, hundreds of hours of audio, are available for free on our website, www.instituteofcatholicculture.org. There you can listen to or download educational programs related to all aspects of our divine faith, and you can review our schedule of upcoming events. We hope you can join us in person. The handout reference during this presentation is available for download on the audio section of our website. Our speaker this evening is pastor of St. Elias Melkite Catholic Church in San Jose, California. Father Sebastian Carnazzo received his master's in theology from the Notre Dame Graduate School of Christendom and his PhD in biblical studies at Catholic University of America in Washington, D.C. He is a full-time lecturer in sacred scripture and biblical languages for the St. Patrick Seminary of the Archdiocese of San Francisco, California, and an adjunct lecturer in sacred scripture for the Notre Dame Graduate School of Christendom College in Alexandria, Virginia. Please welcome Father Sebastian. Thank you, Andy. Thank you. Uh, it's good to be here. Let's begin in prayer, and we'll get started. We have a lot to cover. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and the Holy Spirit, both now and ever, and unto age of ages. Amen. Christ is risen. Indeed, he is risen. Is risen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Secret Dixie. Hallelujah. So we are going to be covering in our three-part series an introduction to St. Paul, a little bit about his life, a little bit about uh, the, the epistles. We can't cover, obviously, everything having to do with St. Paul in a lecture like this. And so uh, I encourage you to let this three-part series be an invitation to further study. As you explore on the ICC library, you'll see there are lots of different uh, courses that have been done on St. Paul and on Acts, some of them that I have done and others have done, continue to study and dive into Acts the Apostles and the Pauline Epistles. Uh, and you'll find that what we're doing tonight in the next two weeks is really just scratching the surface. But what I'm hoping to do in that scratching of the surface is give you a little bit of a window in and a guide into how to approach these epistles, which are often either boring for people or confusing or uh, who knows what. So hopefully after this, the Pauline epistles will be more exciting for you. They'll make more sense to you. And most importantly, when you're sitting there in the church and you're hearing a reading from the Pauline epistles and during, the, during the liturgy, you'll be able to hear the epistle and understand why Paul's saying what he's saying in that way in that particular epistle, because you'll notice he says very different things in different places, not contradictory things, but he's covering lots of different topics. And to the degree that we don't really understand the background of a particular epistle like Galatians or First Thessalonians, etc., we're going to struggle to apply what Paul says there to those particular audiences uh, to our particular situation today. So again, I encourage you to let this be simply an introduction and an invitation to further study. And we can handle also any questions you might have that we're not able to cover in the lecture in the question answer period afterward. So you have the handout. It is a four page handout. It makes it very easy for you to print it off double sided. So it uh, makes it a little more compact for you. But And this is just a basic introduction to or a summary of the things we're going to be talking about tonight. But the vast majority of the things I'm going to be saying to you tonight, scripture references, uh, historical context, things like that, is all right there in the notes in front of you. All right, so looking at that handout, again, if you don't have it, you can just listen. I'm just going to speak in general here and summarize what is on the handout first as an introduction. St. Paul the man, who was he? So Saul or Paul, what is his name? I, I just was listening to a... It was a children's presentation of the historical context of Paul. And uh, they, as often happens, got this part wrong. St. Paul was called Saul before he was a Christian. And then he took on the name Paul 
when he was baptized or he became a Christian. There is no exegetical evidence for that whatsoever. In the ancient world, people who lived in bilingual cultures or multilingual cultures have names that they use in these different contexts. There are probably, probably, I would guarantee out of the 172 logged in tonight, there are probably a few, if not many, who living in a bilingual world, either in their family or having moved from another country, have a name that they use in English, but then a name that they were given by their parents when they were born in their original country, in their original language. So we find this in the New Testament in a number of examples. Think of, for example, Mark the Evangelist. Mark the Evangelist, as we're going to see in Acts tonight. That Mark is a Latin name. That's his Gentile name. But his name that he uses when he's among the Jews, his given name is John. Not to be confused with John the Evangelist. Okay? So John Mark, he's sometimes called, just to keep it straight. And then the example tonight we're talking about is Paul and Saul. Shaul is a Hebrew word, a Hebrew name. And this is what he was called as a child. This is what he was called uh, by his parents. But when he's in Gentile speaking areas, Shaul doesn't, it's not Greek, doesn't sound, what was that? Is there something wrong with you? Shaul, can you repeat that? So he just goes by Pavlos, Pavlos. It's close enough, Shaul, Paul, okay, close enough. He goes by Pavlos when he's among Greek speakers. What that tells you is that this is an individual who is bilingual, bicultural. He was born and raised in Tarsus. Tarsus is up in the upper right-hand corner of the um, Mediterranean. Andy, I sent you a couple maps. I don't know if you that first journey. We can maybe just point there. It's in southern Turkey, modern-day Turkey. This is Asia Minor. And Tarsus was a Roman colony. It was a, a Hellenic city. The main language spoken there would have been Greek. And we can see it there. It's very nice. Thank you. Uh, if you look on the map there, Andy's pulled up. This is one of Paul's journeys. This is Paul's journey to Rome. But if you look in the over on the far right, you can see Antioch. And that's going to be an important city for us tonight. And then also to the left of Antioch, across the little bay there, you see Tarsus. Tarsus was an important city in that region. It was famous for its schools of, its Greek schools of philosophy and rhetoric. We'll talk a little bit more about this on our last night together. We talked about the epistle to the Corinthians. Because he was born in Tarsus, he has Roman citizenship. That was one of the Roman colonies. They named that city a Roman colony, which meant those in the city got a special little ID card, not literally, but they, they were now considered Roman citizens, so they had a special status, and we'll see Paul use that when he needs it. So he's educated in Greek. He speaks Greek fluently. He knows Greek philosophy and Greek rhetoric, and we're going to see him use this when he talks to the Corinthians. He did eventually move to Jerusalem. We don't know exactly when, but he eventually moved to Jerusalem. He was educated under Gamaliel the Great an individual we know from many historical sources, a very important rabbi in that period in the first century in Jerusalem, famous teacher, widely respected, and even mentioned in Acts of the Apostles as well. Paul was educated under him, as he tells us in his epistles. So he knows his Jewish culture well. He knows the Torah well, under, educated by the greatest rabbi of the time. And he became a Pharisee at some stage. Maybe when he came to Jerusalem, he joined the sect of the Pharisees. So while he's in Jerusalem and in that region, as a Pharisee, we see him come on the scene into our little world, in our view, as we're looking at Acts, as a persecutor of the church initially. He's a leader of the martyrdom of Stephen. Okay, so he's the, he is the one who led the charge in the death of Stephen, as we're going to find. So uh, very zealous for the Torah, the great persecutor of the, of the early stage of the church there, as we'll see. And this is all very important to understand when we look at who he eventually becomes. So we see Paul then in his conversion to Christianity on his road to Damascus, which we'll look at in the text. And then he goes to Damascus, he's baptized. 
then we come into the, the Paul that most of us know, the Paul who begins to make journeys around the Mediterranean. And those journeys can be summarized into three, four, five journeys, depending on how you want to count them. His first journey, he leaves from, Act, uh, from Antioch in Syria, and he eventually makes his way into Asia Minor. You can see this on the blue line there on the map. He leaves Antioch, he goes to Cyprus with Barnabas and John Mark, and then they head off into Asia Minor, in Perga, up into Antioch, and I want you to look up at the top there. You see Antioch up in Turkey there? The pointer is on it. This is another Antioch. Don't confuse this with the Antioch of Syria that Andy's pointing at now. The Antioch that you typically hear about in Acts is going to be the Antioch of Syria, but we will see a reference to Antioch of Pisidia, or just simply Antioch, a few times. You've got to keep track of them, so otherwise you get confused of where Paul is. All right. Then eventually, after going to from Antioch of Pisidia, he goes to Iconium, Lystra, and Derbe, and then he reverses his trip and ordains bishops in each of these cities on his return. He doesn't want to leave them without clergy. He had to run from city to city. He was being persecuted. So he, he establishes church, so he converts people, there's baptisms, but then he comes back, checks on them, and as we hear in Acts 14, he ordains ministers for each of these communities. Then he eventually makes his way back to, following that red line, back to Antioch in Syria, his staging ground for most of his journeys. Okay, that's his first missionary journey. It's going to eventually end in Jerusalem, and that's all we need to look at for right now, Paul's journeys. We're going to talk about his other journeys in the next two weeks. But I want you to keep that in mind, what we just talked about in general. Paul, the man, who was he? What's his background? And then also his missionary journeys. We're going to talk about them as you're looking at your notes here. In his first missionary journey, which we'll talk about tonight, his second missionary journey, his third missionary journey, his voyage to Rome, his Roman captivity, his final trip in captivity, and then eventually his martyrdom in Rome. Most introductions to St. Paul are going to give you this basic information. What I'm also giving here, there, there you'll see in the notes, are the epistles that he wrote, as far as we can discern, at which stage of those journeys, which is very helpful to understand uh, those epistles in the historical context. We'll talk more about that. And so in the notes, then, I turn uh, to the... Book of Acts, you'll see that it's on page two of the notes, titled here, as I like to call it, the key to the Pauline epistles. Because the Pauline epistles are often, as I mentioned, so confusing for people. You know today all of the different Christian denominations that are out there today, starting with Luther, now up to 45,000 and multiplying exponentially, based upon some misreadings of some very important passages in Paul. And so it's very important for us to understand Paul in his historical context, because once you do that, all of the confusion that's out there about St. Paul, suddenly, suddenly it makes sense. You understand why there is the confusion, but you, you also have the answer. You have the light to dispel the darkness. And that is why I call Acts the, the key to the Pauline epistles. It gives the historical context for his epistles. Imagine if I took 14 emails randomly chosen from your inbox or your sent box. Okay, right now, I'm going to go into your sent box. Andy has the power to do this. And we'll go into your inbox of your email, Gmail or Hotmail, whatever you're using. He's going to randomly click on 14 emails you've sent. Okay? And then we're going to store those in a box, and someone's going to open them 2,000 years from now and read them. Do you think they'd have any idea what you're talking about? No. Utter confusion. Can you imagine trying to understand who you were? All right, let's take Kathleen. My brother was already picking on her. So Kathleen, she's one of my students, Kristen, so I can pick on her. I, I take 14 randomly, random emails from her inbox, her sent box. And then, uh-oh, Annie's picking them right now. <laughs> and then we put them in a box and we leave them for 2,000 years and someone takes them out and reads them out of their historical context. They know nothing about Kathleen except maybe a few stories they've heard about her. 
and then to read them also, not in the order in which she wrote them. And having no idea who the, the intended audiences were for these emails. Who were her recipients? All right. So can you imagine the variety of emails Andy would find in Kathleen's sent box, but also the variety of intended recipients and the lack of our understanding of who those recipients were will then show as we read these epistles out of their order without their historical context and end up in total confusion. If we all did that right now, 196 participants right now logged in, 2,000 years from now with Kathleen's sent box, we would have 196 different interpretations of who Kathleen was and what she was doing with her life and what she meant in these epistles or those emails, right? And that's what you have today. That's what you have today, tragically. So we've got to have context, context, context. I got to know who Kathleen is. I got to know her life story. I got to know Kathleen's background. I have to know what Kathleen's dealing with when she's writing a particular email. And, and I also have to know as well her intended recipients. And then I might have a chance at beginning to have some understanding of what she was saying. And hopefully that gives you a little window into what we're doing when we're, we're sitting there in, a, in, in the pew on a Sunday, listening to an, a reading from a Pauline epistle, and it's not even the whole epistle, it's just a snippet, a little snippet out of an epistle, which is a snippet out of a, a collection of writings, which is a snippet, a little window into the life of St. Paul 2,000 years ago. Now, don't despair. Don't despair. We have a solution for the problem I presented to you. It's called Acts of the Apostles, the light shining in on these epistles for us, or the key that unlocks the mystery of these epistles. So let's turn now to Acts chapter 1. The notes I have for you uh, begins there on page 2 at Acts chapter 10, where we're going to spend the most majority of our time tonight, 10 through 15. But I want to begin here by skimming through Acts chapters 1 through 9, and just give you some context there, a little background for understanding chapters 10 through 15. So Acts chapter 1, you know the story here. This is the story about Jesus before his ascension, meeting with his, his disciples over 40 days, right, since the Passover, 40 days, and then on the 50th day, after he's ascended, on the 50th day from Passover, we come to the 50th day from Passover, which in Greek is called Pentecosti Imera. It's a Jewish feast called Pentecost, or Weeks, the Feast of Weeks. It was 50 days from Passover. And so just like a major Christian event, the major Christian event happened for us during Passover. So 50 days later, corresponding to just like Israel was at Mount Sinai and received the law, the new Israel, the church, receives not the Torah at Mount Sinai, but here the word of God in the flesh by the power of the Holy Spirit. This is what Pentecost is all about. We've talked about that in other lectures, and so we can't go into details there. I encourage you to look into the ICC library for more help there if you need it. Okay, so at Pentecost in chapter 2, we see this beautiful uh, story of Peter preaching to all of these individuals. And I want you to zero in on something here. It was a pilgrim feast. There were Jews and proselytes, it says. Jews and proselytes. This is chapter 2. Verse 10, Jews and proselytes. That means this is a pilgrim feast. That is, any able-bodied Jew who could afford it and have the time would make a pilgrimage to Jerusalem, even in far-off lands, for the three great feasts, Passover, Pentecost, and tabernacles or booths. Okay, so here we're looking at Pentecost. They're gathered. There's some. These are probably some of the people that were there for Passover. But who is there? There are Jews. And proselytes. What's a proselyte? A convert to Judaism, okay? From the outside Gentile world, a convert. But they are a card-carrying Jew. They're circumcised. They keep kosher, no bacon, okay? They are a card-carrying Jew. But, as we'll see, there are some differences. But they are a Jew, all right? So this is very important to understand. Within the realm of Judaism, you already hear about here, 
two different groups. There are the Jews, and there are the converts to Judaism. All right, so then, there's a third group that we're going to talk about. It's important to understand that you don't want to get these confused. All right, so in chapter 2, after Peter preaches the gospel, it says in verse 37, the crowds, these Jews and proselytes who were there for Pentecost, were cut to the heart. What shall we do? And he says, be baptized, every one of you. Repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sin. For the forgiveness of your sin. So repentance and baptism actually does do something. Sorry, you're swingly. So it actually does something. It changes you. And then he says, you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. We'll talk more about that later. So this is what you are to do when you become, you want to become a Christian? This is what you do, Peter says. Repent, be baptized, and receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Okay, and so 3,000 that day were baptized by the apostles, just like the 3,000 that were put to death at Sinai because of not keeping the Torah and died at the hands of the new priests, the Levites there, at Mount Sinai because of the golden calf incident. Here, 3,000 are brought to life by the hands of the new priests. You can see Luke showing us the parallelism to the first Pentecost at Mount Sinai in recorded Exodus chapters 19 through 24 and 32, et cetera, and then also here for the new Pentecost for the church. All right. What did they do? I want you to look at this. Verse 42, they, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings. They listened to the preach of the apostles, the teachings about Jesus, and fellowship, meetings together. What were they doing when they met together, I wonder? Look what it says, to the breaking of bread and prayer. Anybody with a PhD in biblical studies, I don't care what denomination they're from, if they got a PhD from a legitimate university in Bill says, will tell you that's a reference to early Christian liturgy. There's no debate about that. In the Pauline and Lucan material, when you hear breaking of bread, you're talking about Eucharistic liturgy. And what is absolutely undebatable is that in the early church, when Christians gathered, they gathered, they heard the preaching, and they celebrated the Eucharist, which is exactly what we still do today, 2,000 years later, those apostolic churches. You hear that again in verse 46, day by day uh, attending temple together and breaking bread. Look at that again. So they would break bread in their homes. What does that mean? This, is, this doesn't mean that they didn't go to church. They like to just stay home and you know, watch TV evangelists. This is breaking bread, selling the Eucharist in their homes. This is before there were Christian churches built, before Christianity was legalized. They would meet in one of the larger houses in the community, gather together, and there they would celebrate the Eucharistic liturgy. They would hear the word of God preached. They would do a reading sometimes from, from the Torah the, or a, a, a psalm they would sing of one of the prophets. Then they would hear a story about Jesus, which eventually becomes our Gospels. And then they would break bread. They would have the Eucharistic uh, part of the liturgy. Okay, chapter 3, we hear about Peter and John going to the temple, preaching the gospel, healing a man by the power of Jesus. And then in chapter, in chapter 3, look what it says here. When Peter's preaching, he says in chapter 3, verse 25, you are the sons of the prophets and the covenant which God gave your fathers, saying to Abraham, I want you to highlight this part, and in your posterity shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Under, or highlight that, that's Genesis chapter 12, verse 3, the very important promise to Abraham. Abraham was called from the nations for the sake of the nations. The early church understood clearly that Jesus was that son of Abraham, the new Israel, through whom all the nations should be blessed. We've talked about that in other studies, and we'll come back to that. I want you to highlight that, though. It's very important. And I also want you to underline the word all maybe 300 times. Because that is a topic that's going to be very important when we get into the epistles of the Galatians and also later on today. Chapter 4, we hear about Peter uh, and John preaching there before the Sanhedrin, some initial persecutions. They eventually are let loose. And then in chapter 4 and chapter 5, we also hear about the church continuing to grow, though there are some problems. The church grows. Every time the church is persecuted, it then grows more vigorously out of that persecution. Hopefully that's encouraging. All right. In chapter 5, verse 33 and following, you hear about the Pharisee Gamaliel. There's Gamaliel the Great that, that Paul will refer to in his epistles as well as his teacher. And then in chapter 6, we hear about the 
Jewish speaking Christians, the Aramaic uh, Jewish Christians, and the Greek speaking Jewish Christians about a, a problem over distribution of bread, and, the, and then the apostles create the diaconate because of this to help out. More on that in another lecture. In chapter 6, verse 8 and following, and then to chapter 7, we hear about the persecution of Stephen and eventually his martyrdom. And then in chapter 8, in chapter 8, we get our reference to, our first reference to Paul or Saul. Chapter 8, verse 1, and Saul was consenting to his death. I want you to put a little note there in your paragraph break. You have a little paragraph break there in your Bible, a little space there, put 22 colon 20. 22 colon 20, right there at chapter 8, verse 1. And that'll remind you, this is later on, Paul will explain what that meant, consenting to his death, and that they laid their garments at the feet of Saul, which is mentioned in chapter 7, verse 58. That means he was the foreman on the job. Okay, he was involved in this. All right, so chapter 8, then we hear about with persecution, then of course the church spreads as the, as the Christians flee the persecution in Jerusalem, Judea, of course, the gospel spreads too. And so now the, the faith is spreading out as the Jewish persecution tightens its grasp on the church. The Christians slip between their fingers and are now everywhere. And so because of that, then Paul or Saul has to go now, not just in Jerusalem, Judea, persecuting Christians. He decides to head off even as far as Damascus. Even as far as Damascus, Damascus is in Syria. And it's far north of Galilee. All right, so he heads up to Damascus, and that story is in chapter 9. But Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus. So why does he want letters for the synagogues in Damascus? Because that's where the, if he's going to find Christians, where is he going to find them? In the synagogues. So what are they doing in the synagogues? Because they're all Jews. This is so critical to understand. There is not a single uncircumcised, unkosher Christian yet. All right? This is really critical to grasp. And that is the main point of the lecture tonight and uh, important for understanding our lecture next week. Okay? Look at that. He's going to the synagogues in Damascus. He's going to head up to Syria. Where is he going to find Christians in Syria? Well, he's going to head to a main city, Damascus, where he's heard there are Christians. So where is he going to find them? At the synagogues. Why? Because that's where Jews go on Saturday, to the synagogue. So that's where he'll find them. You see how that works? Really important. And he's going to have letters for the elders of the synagogue saying, if there are any of these Nazareans among you, these guys who are following this Jesus from Nazareth, you let me know. Oh, yeah, oh, that guy over there, you see him over here? Uh, okay, let's get him. So how would they find them? Because they're Jews. They're Jewish Christians, still part of the Jewish community, still attending synagogue on the Sabbath. Very critical to understand what we're going to see tonight and next week. Okay, so eventually you know the story. Uh, he's heading off to Damascus, and uh, a light shines before him. Jesus speaks to him and says, why are you persecuting me? And so he eventually he heads to Damascus, and he is healed uh, of his blindness from this flash of light by Ananias, one of the Christians in Damascus. And I want you to note verse 18, and he was baptized at once. I'm pointing that out to you because this is so critical to understand. If you want to understand Paul, you've got to understand sacramental theology. Well, understand Paul. If you want to understand theology, if you want to understand the church, if you ever hear someone telling you about salvation and they're not mentioning baptism, which includes confirmation, as you know from our last ICC lecture, and Eucharist, if they don't mention to you baptism, confirmation, and Eucharist, then you are not hearing apostolic preaching. You're not hearing an apostolic understand salvation. If you go back and you look at Acts, you look at the point epistles, central to the, the preaching of salvation was baptism and the Eucharist. We'll talk more about that in other, uh, other lectures as well, and also later on next week and the week after. But 
Uh, if you did miss out on our lecture from the ICC, Blood and Water, you can go back and review that, where we talked about the importance and the centrality in the early church of baptism, confirmation, or chrismation, and Eucharist. Okay, chapter 9, Paul, after his conversion, goes into the synagogue in Damascus and preaches the gospel of Jesus Christ to those who would listen. You might want to notice here, also, as you read through Acts, we don't have time to look at all these, but there's places where you hear Paul on the Sabbath going to the synagogue. Seventh-day Adventists will read that and say, you see, he was a seventh-day Adventist. He was a good Sabbath keeper. No, it's just, when are you going to find Jews in a city? And where are you going to find them? You're going to find them at the synagogue, and you're going to find them there only on the Sabbath. So that's when Paul went to the synagogue was on the Sabbath, not to sit there and sing uh, Kumbaya with the local Jewish community, but rather to preach the Gospels. You're reading each one of these stories. So that's for another lecture, maybe on the seven-day Adventist. Chapter 9 then turns to the story of Peter. And then finally, after chapter 9 tells us about Peter and Peter being in Joppa or Yopa, we then hear about the story that is so critical for us tonight and for next week. And that is the story about the, what do we do with these Gentiles who want to come into the church? Okay, so chapter 10, let's turn there now. And you can also, if you like, you can look at your notes on page two of your notes, chapter 10 of Acts. You can see right there, I've got it all laid out there for you. Okay. Okay. Acts chapter 10. At Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion, what was known as the Italian cohort. Now, you hear that information, and you say, oh, that's nice. Caesarea, Caesarea, that's an Italian. Oh, he's, a, he's an Italian. Likes pizza, I guess. It, means, it really doesn't mean anything to us. But it meant a lot to Luke's audience. Notice he gave you those details. Why did he give you that? Couldn't you just said there was a man in a nearby city? Caesarea, this is not Caesarea Philippi that you hear in Matthew chapter 16. This is Caesarea on the coast, Caesarea Maritime. If, you, if you're in Jerusalem and you want to head to the beach, you basically, you'd head, you'd head to the beach and head north. You can see Jerusalem there on the bottom corner. And then from Jerusalem, you go downhill. Any of you have been on the ICC pilgrimages, remember our long journey uphill from Tel Aviv, which is not far from there. So Jerusalem goes downhill. You go down to the coast there to Caesarea or Caesarea. All right, so this is the city of Caesar. There is also Caesarea Philippi. Anyone who wanted to make Caesar happy, they'd name us, they'd found a city and name it after Caesar. Make sure that he kept you on your throne. So this city was a, a Gentile city, all right? Caesarea. I want you to look at that city, its location. It's within the promised land. This is the blemish of blemishes. If you are a Pharisee, you would hope that there'd be a massive earthquake and Caesarea would fall off into the Mediterranean. Okay? This is the Gentile city within your, within your land. Jerusalem, while important for the Jews, was basically irrelevant for the Romans. Caesarea Maritime, or Caesarea on the sea, was the Roman administrative capital in that region. Okay? So now... You're a Pharisee in the first century, or you're a Jewish Christian. Think about this. What would you think if you heard about, this is a Gentile city. It's filled with Gentiles, filled with Gentile soldiers, and filled with Gentile pagan temples. Okay? I want you to think of Las Vegas, 2 a.m. on a Friday night, Saturday night. Okay? You're getting a hint at the image that would have been in the minds of a Jew in the first century. When you said Caesarea, you would have spit. Okay? So Caesarea, this is where the Roman soldiers are dropped off in their boats and come onto your land. This is where the Roman soldiers go on leave. This is where all the tax money is sent as it's collected, sent to Caesarea, loaded on boats, and it goes off to Rome. You cannot mention a city more hated than Caesarea for a Jew in the first century. Okay, at Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius. Now, Cornelius, if you've had any Latin classes, I'm sure you, you've heard this name before. It's a common Latin name. Usually any man in a, in a Latin grammar is going to be Cornelius. Cornelius, a Latin name. 
Why would he tell you the guy's name? Notice that U.S. on the end. This is Latin. This isn't Greek. Roman soldiers in the region often were hirelings from Syria because they could speak Greek and Aramaic. This isn't a local Gentile. This is one of the Romans. So you've got a Roman city in the land of Palestine. Now he refers to one of the Romans themselves. You would have spit again. And he was a centurion. Oh, I hate those guys. A centurion? He's a head of a hundred soldiers. But these aren't Syrian soldiers, guys you might be able to get along with. These are Italians. I can say that because of my last name. Okay, I can make fun of these guys. So, so these were Italian soldiers. These were Romans. You cannot, he just said to you, Rome, in the city of Rome, there was a Roman who was over a head of a hundred Roman soldiers. Now, just as he told you that and really, really got under your skin, he tells you something else very strange. He says this. He was a devout man. What? Who feared God. No way. Not this one. Please don't. With all of his household? No. And he gave alms liberally to the people, and he prayed constantly to God. Oh, Luke, please don't. Could you give us a better one? Not this one. No. Okay. What Luke has just shown you is the most, most offensive Gentile you can imagine. But he's a problem. He's a God-fearer. That's that third group I wanted you to think about. There were Jews in the first century in Judea, Jerusalem, even in the city of Rome and wherever you want, Caesar, wherever you went, there were Jewish neighborhoods. And there were proselytes, converts to Judaism, card-carrying Jews, though genetically not descendants of Abraham. And then there was a third group that were called God-fearers. These would be basically what a, a modern Christian might think of a catechumen. They were referred to sometimes by the Jews as proselytes standing at the door. They had not yet converted completely to Judaism in the mind of a Jew. They were a Gentile, former polytheist, tree stump worshiping pagan, who had realized his error and decided to become a monotheist and worship the God of Abraham. Okay? They worshiped the God of Abraham. They were converts to Judaism, but not really. They were not circumcised, and they still ate bacon. They did not keep kosher. Okay? So these are three very important groups to keep a handle on as we read the rest of our section in Acts tonight and critical to understand our reading next week in the epistle to the Galatians. All right. Let's pick up where we left off there in chapter 10, chapter 10 of Acts. We hear about this this strange character who is the most offensive individual you can imagine as a Jew in the first century, aside from Caesar himself, okay? Actually, this guy might be even more offensive because he's right there in their land. And when you're thinking of a soldier, don't think of a modern American soldier or something. This is not what we're talking about. We're talking about Roman soldiers. It typically, if, you, if I say a mercenary or something maybe like that, you might get some more a little closer idea to what these guys were and how they lived. They weren't paid very well. They tended not to be necessarily the best characters. So Roman soldiers, when they rolled into town, you hid your wife and children from them, and you hid your and you ran to the hills if you could. You just you didn't know what was going to happen. So he's just told you about a, a very offensive individual, but then he says, "Wait a minute, this isn't what you think. He's a god fearer." Oh. A God fear, a devout man who feared God, a convert to Judaism, sort of. A, from a Jewish perspective, he's a proselyte, a convert standing at the door. He's not quite all the way in, okay? And it's critical to understand this. What makes him different from a proselyte, from a convert to Judaism? 
not his monotheism, but his obedience to the kosher laws and circumcision. And he'd probably go to the synagogue on a Sabbath that they'd let the guy in. Uh, but he is not kosher. He does, he's not circumcised, and he does not keep kosher. And for the Jews, this was a critical thing. You know, if you look at the circumcision of the kosher laws in the Torah, it's kind of a minor, uh, if you, you, all the verses in the Torah on the law of Moses, those that are devoted to circumcision in the kosher law is not a whole lot. There's a lot dealing with sacrifice and all sorts of other things. However, for the Jew living in a foreign land, especially, these are the things they could do. You could go to the synagogue on the Sabbath. You could make sure your boys were circumcised. And you made sure there was no bacon in the house. You kept kosher. But that was about all you could do, aside from maybe going on a pilgrimage once in a lifetime or something, especially living on distance to the city of Jerusalem. There you might see Jews keeping the whole Torah, Pharisees you'd see, uh, and, and offering sacrifices. Think if you were a Jew who were, you were raised in the city of Rome or in Alexandria or something like that. You can't offer sacrifice in the temple. You can't offer your tithes to the temple. What do you do? So they did the best they could in the situation they were in, but the things they could do, they kept those very seriously because those were pretty much the only things they could do that set them apart from the Gentiles around them. Very important for tonight and also for next week. The kosher laws, the keeping of the kosher laws, and circumcision. Okay? All right, so now, chapter 10, we hear about this man who is a God-fearer, who is not circumcised and not keeping kosher, but he's devout. With his whole household, he's converted them all. And about the ninth hour of the day, so 3 p.m., ninth hour of the day, he's praying the hours. The Jews kept the hours, right? At sunrise, they prayed. At 9 a.m., they prayed. At noon, they prayed. At 3 p.m., they prayed. And then at 6 p.m., they prayed. The hours of prayer, the five hours of prayer, right? You still see these in the monasteries. You see these in, uh, in some of our churches. Uh, you'll see them, um, the clergy will sometimes keep these. All right, so this is a, an ancient uh, prayer tradition. He's praying at 3 p.m., and about the ninth hour of the day, he saw clearly in a vision an angel of God coming in and saying to him, Cornelius, and he stared at him in terror. Now, why would this be? Because angels in the Bible are not overweight little babies with wings taken on their backs. That's a post-Renaissance image of Cupid that unfortunately infected Western artwork in the post-Renaissance period. But angels in Christian artwork before the Renaissance were always pictured as a, a soldier, uh, a grown man, and not an effeminate Swedish one either. They were grown men, usually described, shown as an angel with a big sword and things like that. And when they appear in the Bible, people are terrified. Why? Because when angels appear in the Bible, usually people die. Someone's going to get killed. Okay, this is the army of God. And so he's terrified. He's a soldier. He knows that, you know, this is, this is a soldier to watch out for. So he's terrified. And he said to him, what, what is it, Lord? He heard his name. Cornelius, he said to him, your prayers and your alms have ascended as a memorial before God. Right, right, like incense, right? Psalm 140 or 141, let my prayer arise like incense. Has ascended to God. What prayer is it? He says, now. Send men to Joppa, Joppa, and bring one Simon, who is called Peter. He is lodging with Simon, a tanner, whose house is by the seaside. So Joppa was a, a little Jewish fishing village just a few miles south of Caesarea. Okay, just a very small little city. All right, so then it says, he says, and now send men to Yopa and bring one Simon who is called Peter. He is lodging there with Simon the Tanner, whose house is by the seaside. When the angel spoke to him, had departed, he called two of his servants, a devout soldier. So who are the servants? The servants are part of his household. Remember, his whole household are God-fearers. That means his wife, all of his children, also any servants that are in the home. Servants were, in that period, slaves were part of the family. Don't think, when you hear about slaves in the Bible, don't think of Alabama and the early experiment, was the horrible, tragic experiment with slavery here in America. But the slavery in the Greco-Roman world 
was very different. Not to say it was okay either, but it was very different. Slaves were bought off the slave block, but they were usually treated as members of the household. They had time off. When they were done with their work, they could go and hang out with their friends downtown, and they'd come back because they had a house, they had a bed, they had food, and they could also buy their freedom. They could go have side jobs, make money, and eventually they could say, hey, master, how much you pay for me? Ten shekels? There you go. No, oh, okay, thank you. And then you let them go. So they were very different. They had rights. There were laws protecting them in the, in the Greco-Roman world. So these servants are part of Cornelius' house. They're slaves in his house, but they're part of his household. So these are God-fearers as well and a devout soldier. So one of, at least one of, probably many, within his cohort of 100 guys, he's already converting them. So one of them, he sends a devout soldier to protect these two servants, and they head down south to Yopa, a couple miles down south, down the coast. And it says, and having related everything to them, he sent them to Yopa. Verse 9, the next day as they were on their journey and coming near the city, Peter went up on the housetop to pray. It was about the sixth hour. The housetop sounds a little strange for us. They didn't have slanted roofs. They had flat roofs. If you've ever been to Palestine, you can still see that style of building. I remember when we were on uh, one of the ICC pilgrimages, we were outside of Jericho. And you could see out in the plain of Jericho a few of these very simple houses that are identical to how they were building them 2,000 years ago. They're just a, a basically a cube with a flat roof, stairs on the side to go up to the top, and a door to go in. And uh, one big room, one, one room. They would hang out up on top of the roof. The roof fit, functioned kind of like our back patio. There was a little more breeze up there. At night, you would sleep up there if it was hot. You could store stuff up there that you didn't want your neighbors to see. You know, you could throw some junk up there and, you know, things like that. All right. So he's up on the rooftop praying. It's the sixth hour. Sixth hour. What is that? That's six from 6 a.m. It's lunchtime, right? 12 noon. And he became hungry. I wonder why. It's noon. And he desired something to eat. But while they were preparing it, he fell into a trance. So they're down below. The ladies of the house are down below getting the food ready. Peter goes up the stairs, up to the top, and he's up on the roof praying. And he's starting to smell the food coming up through the roof tiles and trying to concentrate. And he falls into a trance and saw the heavens open and something descending like a great tablecloth coming down to the earth. Now, I know it says sheet there, but it throws you off. You think, sheet? Am I a, a bed sheet? So, tablecloth. Now you understand what's going on. In that period, in that region, they typically didn't eat on a table. If they did, it was a very low-lying table, something you might see in a traditional home in Japan or something. But they typically just ate on the floor. They would keep the floor clean. Of course, they were Jews. And uh, the women in the house would sweep it clean, keep it clean. And then when it was time for, for a meal... They would throw down a sheet, a tablecloth, basically, a sheet, and then they would put the food in the middle of it, and the people who were going to eat would sit around on the tablecloth, sit down, and eat. All right? So this is what happens. He sees a tablecloth in his dream at lunchtime coming down, right? What's he expecting to see? Oh, something. You know, matzo balls. I don't know what he's expecting. Something kosher, at least. So he says, it says, and then he looked in. And he saw all kinds of animals, reptiles, and birds of the air. Birds of the air is a reference to the carnivorous birds. You know, Jews could eat pigeons and things like that. But birds of the air, this is a reference to not the ground-going birds, like the chickens and things like that, the fowl, but the birds of the air, the hawks and the vultures. Those were unclean, according to the book of Leviticus. Reptiles? No way. No rattlesnake, no lizards. Okay reptiles and birds of the air. And they came, there came a voice, rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, no way. Right? No way. These lips never touched anything unclean before, and they're not going to do it today. So this happens three times. Three times he hears the words, what God has cleansed, you must not call common or profane. All right, so you can see how it works. What God has cleansed, you must not call unclean. All right, so the, the Jews were clean. They saw themselves as clean. The Gentile world, 
unclean, common man, unclean. Holy man, Jew, clean. Holy, that is set apart. Unclean or common, right, was the Gentile. So, what? Reptiles, birds of the air are now clean? So, as he's trying to figure out what this is all about, this happened three times, and, he, and, and then it was taken to heaven. Verse 17, as he was perplexed as what this meant, suddenly the men arrived from Caesarea. All right, so then Peter invites them in, and they relate to him the story of what had happened to Cornelius. Verse, that's verse 23. So he called them in to be his guest. The next day he rose and went off with them. Some of the brethren, this is verse 23, some of the brethren also went with him from Yopa. Okay, so some of the brethren, look at that word brethren. What do we mean the brethren? His brothers? His relatives? No, these are Jewish Christians, in the book of Acts, and in the Pauline literature, a brother or a sister means a fellow Christian, okay, brethren. So some of the brethren, we're going to find there were six Jewish Christians that went with him, right? They're not letting him go to Caesarea by himself. Who knows what could happen there? So they go there with him to accompany him. Verse 24, on the following day, they entered Caesarea. Can you imagine? Okay, Las Vegas, 2 a.m., Try to get some images. You're, hopefully some of you are cringing. All right? Some of you may have never been to Las Vegas. Count of the blessing, okay? Imagine what they would see. Cult prostitutes on every corner. Pagan temples with smoke billowing out of them. Sacrifices to the pagan gods. Soldiers everywhere. Gentiles everywhere. They're petrified. Are we going to get killed? What are they going to do? Are they going to eat us? Maybe they'll sacrifice us to Zeus. Who knows what these animals will do? So they're going into Caesarea, and they go straight to Cornelius' house. Right? They're being led there by the two servants and the soldier. Cornelius was expecting them, and had called together his kinsmen and close friends. His kinsmen and close friends. He's an evangelist. Look at this guy. Right? He had already converted his whole household, and he's already working on the soldiers, and now he hears Peter's coming. He calls together all of his family kinsmen, and close friends as well to hear this. When Peter entered, Cornelius met him, fell down at his feet, and worshipped him. Peter lifted up and said, stand up, I too am a man. Worshipped him, this doesn't mean, uh, worship is an old English word here. It's perfectly fine old English, but not a good English translation here. Knelt before him. The Roman soldier, to show honor to someone above them, uh, a soldier would walk up to Cornelius and kneel down on one knee, and Cornelius say, arise. And what do, you, what do you need from me? When Cornelius goes to one of his superiors, he'd go down on one knee, rise, what do you need from me? When they would stand before Caesar, they'd do the same thing. So Cornelius sees Peter coming. He realized, this guy outranks me. This guy, he, he, God has sent him to me. So he kneels down, and Peter says, get up. I'm just a man. Verse 26, Peter lifted him up and said, stand up, I too am man. Verse 27, and as he talked with him, he went in and found many persons gathered. Wow. Wow. What an opportunity. What an opportunity. He saw many persons gathered and he said to them, I'm so happy you're here today to hear me preach the gospel. Uh, Abraham, can you get some water? We're going to need some oil for uh, chrismation. And uh, no, look what happens here. You yourselves know how unlawful, un, highlight unlawful 300 times. This is what we're talking about. Unlawful. What do you mean unlawful? Against the, you know, the state laws? No. Unlawful means contrary to the law of Moses. Untorah. Unkosher. It is. This is contrary to the law given by Moses, just like those reptiles I saw were. Okay? So unlawful. Highlight that 300 times. Put flashing lights around little stars and bells. Unlawful It was, is for a Jew, underline Jew 300 times, to associate with or visit anyone of another nation. Of another nation. Remember that promise to Abraham we mentioned earlier? All right. Of another nation. But God has shown me that I should not call any man common or unclean from his dream. All right. So when I was sent for, I came without objection. I asked them why you sent for me. That's it? That's all you got, Peter? Well, there's a problem. 
up to this point, the church has not baptized a single non-Jewish individual. They baptized Jews. They baptized converts to Judaism, which are considered Jews, proselytes to Judaism. You heard of one of them in, in, in the list of the deacons, a proselyte to Judaism for Antioch. But they have not baptized a single uncircumcised, unkosher individual. Why not? We're going to see why not. And the fact that people don't know this is why we have such confusion today when we read the epistle to the Galatians or to Romans. The reason why Luther got so off track when he read Galatians and Romans is this very reason. He had no idea about the historical context. I said, what do you mean? I mean, didn't he, hadn't he read Acts? Of course not. Have you ever read Acts? How many people of the 212 that are signed in tonight have read Acts the Apostles? Okay, I see one hand go up. Go, oh, you ICC people, you're not normal, you know that. All right, so think of, take, a, take a poll of your average Christian out there, especially your average Catholic. Have read Acts? They might, say, they might not know what it is. You think Luther knew what it was? He might have had it, yes, he sure he knew what Acts was, and maybe he didn't read it once in his life, but he didn't understand its historical context for the Pauline epistles, and I can tell you that because when you read Luther's commentary on Romans, chapter 3, verse 28, his money passage, as he thought, not a single reference to the historical context of Judaism, though Paul refers to it in that passage. We'll talk about that next week. Okay, so I want you to pay close attention to this. That's a major point that you have to grasp to understand what's going to go on the rest of Acts and the Pauline epistles. Verse 30, Cornelius said, okay, look, four days ago I was praying, this angel appeared to me, I was a little scared, but uh, he said to send for you and so, and that you had some message for us, so we're all here. Now, let's have it. Mm. Verse 34, Peter opened his mouth and said, truly I perceive that God shows no partiality. Did you think he did before, Peter? So underline no partiality. We're going to see this come up in, later on in Acts. We're going to see it come up in the Pauline epistles. Very important. When you hear that language, you know what you're dealing with. You're dealing with the issue of Jew versus Gentile, circumcision versus uncircumcision, kosher versus unkosher. Okay? So no partiality. But in every nation, there's that nation coming up again, anyone who fears him, a God-fearer, and does what is right is acceptable to him. You know the word which he sent to Israel, preaching good news of peace and by Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. The word which was proclaimed throughout all Judea, beginning with Galilee, after the baptism which John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with the power, how he went about doing all sorts of good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses to all that he did, both in the country of the Jews in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree, it's a reference to Deuteronomy, right? They tried to curse him. But God raised him on the third day and made him manifest not to all the people, but to us who were chosen by God as witnesses who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach to the people to testify that he is the one ordained by God to be judge of the living and the dead. There you go. There's a, a summary of the gospel right there, right? To him, all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sin through his name. All right, now there's a problem. Hold your hand there and flip back to Acts chapter 2, verse 37. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said, Peter and the rest of the apostles, what shall we do? They're basically at the same state as Cornelius' house is. They're ready and willing. The door is open. But look what Peter says here compared to what he said in the house of Cornelius. Look here. He says, repent, be baptized, every one of you, forgive your sin, and you shall receive the Holy Spirit. And then they start baptizing. Notice there's no debate about whether they should baptize these people. This is in Acts chapter 2. Why? They're all Jews and proselytes. They're all converts to Judaism. They're all circumcised. They're all kosher keeping. Now look at the difference here. Look at chapter 10, verse 43. To him, all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him, not just Jews, everyone who believes in him, right? You know, read the prophets. That's what they say. Well, you see this come up in Acts in, the, in chapter 15 as well. Everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sin through his name. Peter, did you want to mention, is there something about water you want to talk about here? 
Shouldn't someone be getting some water? Verse 44, while Peter was still saying this, the Holy Spirit fell on all who believed, who heard the word. Look at the word all there, underline all as well. All who were in the house. Verse 45, and the believers from among the circumcised, underline circumcised 300 times, so you can see what's going on here. Those are the guys who were with Peter, the six brethren who came from Yopa. The believers, Christians, who were circumcised, don't you forget, who came with Peter, were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on Gentiles. Uncircumcised, unkosher, you could probably smell bacon on their breath. They're amazed. Why are they amazed? Because it was inconceivable. Why is it inconceivable? Well, there's a lot to un un unpack here, and we'll be doing that next week. But look at that. Verse 46. For they heard them speaking in tongues and extolling God. So they're speaking in languages just like at Pentecost. Now, who was at Pentecost? Circumcised, kosher-keeping Jews. The apostles. Here, uncircumcised, unkosher-keeping god fears are speaking in languages just like the apostles did. No partiality, huh? Look at this. For they heard them speaking in languages. Then Peter declared, verse 47, can anyone forbid water for baptizing these people? Look at the word forbid. Underline that. Look at the question mark. Highlight that question mark 3,000 times. Why is Peter asking this question? Was anyone forbidding it before Peter? Yeah, everyone. They, they had not done it. And so Peter looks at this and says, guys, what do we do now? Can anyone here? Abraham, Yaakov, come on. Can anyone now continue with what we've done and that is not baptizing Gentiles? Can we continue with this? Can anyone forbid water of baptizing them who have received the Holy Spirit just as we did, who were circumcised and no bacon for us? So then look what it says. Verse 48, he commanded them to be baptized. Why? Look at the command. Why did he command it? He's an apostle, and he has to. Can you imagine? Abraham, get the water. I'm not getting the water. No way. Jacob, get the water. Mm -mm, mm -mm. You get it, Peter. I'm not going to. Nope. He had, to, he had to command them to do it. So you can see the dug their heels in about this. Why? We'll talk about that later. Chapter 11. Now the apostles and the brethren who were in Judea heard that the Gentiles also received the word of God, and they threw a big party for them. So when Peter went to Jerusalem, the circumcision party criticized him. So criticized him? Don't you think they'd be happy? Peter went to the house of a Roman soldier. Wouldn't it be nice to have a couple of Roman soldiers as Christians? That'd be nice protection, wouldn't it be? They don't care about that. Peter just did something very, very bad, at least in their perspective. Look what he did. It says, why did you go to, underline, uncircumcised men and, underline, eat with them? Peter stayed there, it says, for many days. What do you think they were eating? You felt the fish? So Peter stayed in an unkosher home. He baptized unkosher people who were uncircumcised, and he lived in the house with them and ate breakfast with them. I guarantee they had bacon. Cheese on the burger the whole bit. So look at that tension there. So who do they think they are criticizing Peter? One of the 12? Prince of the apostles? Look what, look what Peter then does. He says, look, look, let me explain, okay? So he begins to recite the whole thing. We don't have we don't even look at it here. But he, he recites the whole thing to him, tells him what happened. He says, look, I, it wasn't me. It was the Holy Spirit. Look what he says in verse, verse 15. This is chapter 11, verse 15. As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell on them just as it did on us at the beginning. Notice his reference back to Pentecost. And I remembered the word which the Lord had said. Hmm? Verse 17, if then God gave the same gift of the Holy Spirit to them as he gave to us when we believed in the Lord Jesus, who was I to withstand God? So don't argue with me. Right? If baptism is supposed to be the thing you do, which eventually gives you the Holy Spirit, 
and they already received the Holy Spirit, then I thought it would probably be appropriate to baptize these people. God went ahead and did it because we weren't doing it. Chapter 11, verse 18. When they heard this, they were silenced. Well, you can see there was a hot debate here. And they glorified God, saying, then to the Gentiles also God has granted repentance unto life. That's the best they could say. Verse 19. Now, those who were scattered because the persecution arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, right? Now they're heading north up to Cyprus and Antioch. They're headed up to Antioch. They're headed into Cyprus. They're headed into Gentile land. The church is beginning to spread out of Jewish territory, right? So you can see Jerusalem down there. They're, the church is heading up. Caesarea, Caesarea, and then it's going to start heading up into Antioch in Syria. There's Jews up there, but mainly Gentiles, okay? Now look what it says here in chapter 11, verse uh, 19. And they went to Cyprus in Antioch, speaking the word to none except Jews. Do you hear that language? There's still that tension. You say, well, wait a minute, didn't they already resolve the problem? No way. This is just the beginning, okay? They're still not wanting to, all right, Peter, you preached that you made a mess there in, Corn, in Cornelius' house in Caesarea. But let's just kind of forget that and let's move on, okay? So they go up there and they, they're preaching in Gentile regions, but they're preaching only to Jews in the synagogue. But then look at the next line. It says, but there were, this is verse 20, but there were some men of Cyprus, Jews of Cyprus who spoke Greek. In Cyrene, northern Africa, who speak Greek, right? Who on coming to Antioch spoke to Greeks. Hmm. Okay, now Greek there doesn't mean a guy from Athens. You're talking about a, a Gentile. The word Greek is used in Acts and the point epistles typically to mean non-Jew. Why is that? Because the non-Jews who had controlled them before the Roman Empire was the, the Greek Empire. And the Roman Empire just continued to use the Greek administration, the, the, the language, the Greek language in that region. So for the, the Jews, the Roman Empire was just an extension. It was just the sequel of the Greek Empire. So they refer to the Gentiles as the Greeks. All right, so it says, and he preached in the, uh, the Lord Jesus, and the hand of the Lord was with them. And we hear about for a full year that Barnabas was sent there. Barnabas is a Greek speaker. He's a Jew who speaks Greek. So they sent Barnabas there to preach the gospel there and, and, and confirm the church and establish it strongly. And he said, well, I got to go get that guy, Shaul, Saul, who's from Tarsus, which you remember is just across the bay from Antioch. Do you remember that? So he goes and gets Saul and brings him back to Antioch because Saul is also a Greek-speaking, highly educated Jew and highly educated in Greek culture. So Barnabas and Saul formed this initial team of establishing the church of Antioch. And it says there in verse 26, this is where we first see the word Christian. It was there that the disciples, that is the followers of Jesus, were first called Christian. Verse 27, the story continues. Chapter 12, we hear about some more persecution of the church. The death of James, the apostle, is mentioned there in chapter 12, verse 2. He's the first among the apostles to die as a martyr. And then in chapter 13, we hear about Paul's first journey. And we're just going to skim here. Our purpose here is not to look at all the details of Paul's life and everything he did, but just to get enough information so we can jump into Galatians and understand it and some of the other epistles next week and the week after. In verse Two, we hear about the church sending Barnabas and Saul out by the power of the Holy Spirit. They prayed over them, and they said, the Lord sends you. And they sent them, Saul and Barnabas were sent off from the church in Antioch to go convert more people throughout Asia Minor. So Antioch becomes the springboard for Paul's preaching to the Gentile world, as you're going to see as you read the rest of Acts. In chapter 13, we also hear that John Mark was with them. John Mark was with him. He's referred to John and Mark in chapter 12, verse 25. You can see it there, John Mark, John whose other name was Mark. And then in chapter 13, verse 5, 
They said that John was with them. That's not John the Evangelist. That's John Mark. He sometimes called John, sometimes he's called Mark. So you got to keep track of that. Okay. So Paul, the original Pauline team for the first journey is Paul, Barnabas, and they took along with them John Mark. Why? He's Barnabas's cousin. He's from Cyprus, and they speak. He speaks Greek as well. Very important early church figure. He's going to eventually write what we know as the Gospel of Mark, as he becomes a disciple of Peter in Rome. Okay, so then we hear the, the rest of Paul's first journey here. We don't have time to look at all the details. Just as a summary of what we see here in chapter 13 and 14, he goes from Antioch to Cyprus. Why? <laughs> That's where Barnabas and Mark are from. So they go to their home island, right? So they go there. Hey, we know some people here. So this is an easy place to start the trip. So they go to Cyprus, they travel through Cyprus. When they're done with Cyprus, they head off into Asia Minor, to Perga, up to Antioch of Pisidia, to Iconium, Lystra, and Derbe. They're persecuted along the way by the Jewish synagogues. Why? Because that's where they went to every city. They went to the synagogue, they preached the gospel, the synagogue was split in two. Half of them accepted the gospel, half of them did not. Those that did not accept the gospel chased Paul out of town. And Paul would then head off, in the middle of the night, sometimes running for his life to the next town. He went to Iconium, Lystra, Derbe, and then eventually, when things kind of quiet down, he quietly sneaks back into these towns and ordains, as we hear in chapter 14, clergy for each one of these cities. This is recorded in chapter 14, verse 19. But the Jews came from Antioch and Iconium, and having persuaded, persuaded the people, they stoned Paul. They left him for dead. He was still alive. Verse 21, when they had preached the gospel to that city and made many disciples in Derbe, they returned to Lystra in Iconium and to Antioch. You see that in verse 21? That's Antioch of Pisidia. Don't confuse that with Antioch of, of Syria. Strengthening the souls of the disciples. Look at that. When Paul returns to a city, a uh, church that he established, it's called to strengthen the souls or strengthen the disciples. Okay, we're going to see that come up in other places. It's very important for understanding Galatians. And what did he do? Strengthening the soul of the disciples, exhorting them to continue in the faith, saying that through much wealth and health, you will enter the kingdom of God. Oh, it's not what it says. Sorry, that's the health and wealth gospel of Benny Hinn. So what the Bible says, though, is through many tribulations, you will enter the kingdom of God. Right? Just like the suffering of Jesus, you will you should expect to suffer too. Verse 23, and when they had appointed elders... For them in every church, with prayer and fast, they committed them to the Lord. So appointed there. The word in Greek is literally to stretch out the hand. This is still the official word for ordination in Greek in the church today. This is the word we use in the Eastern Church, where our liturgy is in Greek in the official text, that the stretching out of the hand, the bishop lays his hand on the individual. I point that out to you because in English it sounds kind of funny. He appointed, right? Hey, you, you, and you, you guys take over here. No, 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 no. He laid his hands up. He appointed, that is, he ordained. This is in the Greek word here is usually translated in, in church as to ordain. Okay? Now, the, next, the other word here, elders, presbytery. This is eventually where we got our word priest from. In this context, in this early stage of the church, and again, all scholars, anyone with a PhD in early church history, I don't care what their denomination is, they, they'll tell you it's clear in the New Testament that the early church clergy were this. You had the apostles who were traveling from place to place, preaching the gospel as they could. You had resident apostles who were appointed, who were then called bishops, episcopus, an overseer who was an apostle who didn't go anywhere. Apostle means sent. So they, they just stayed there. They were an overseer. So the apostle would establish a church and then appoint an individual to stand in their place, a bishop or sometimes many bishops for that city. And then the bishops would give themselves some deacons, and that was the early church. It's not until you get to the later part of the first century that we get what we call the priest, that intermediate uh, clerical state between the, the deacon and the bishop. More on that in another lecture. All right, so he appointed elders, that is bishops and deacons, for each one of these churches, right? He's got to leave them with the sacraments. And verse 24, they passed through Pisidia and came to Pamphylia, and eventually, verse 26, they came back to Antioch. All right, now look what it says there, where they had been commended to the grace of God, 
Look at verse 27. And when they arrived, they gathered the church together and declared all that God had done with them and how he had opened a door of faith to the highlight 300 times. Gentiles. Chapter 15. But some men came down from Judea. Now, don't think down on a map. We're talking downhill, okay? They came from Judea. They came north. Jewish Christians came from Jerusalem and from Judea to Antioch. And they were preaching that unless you are circumcised, you Gentile Christians who have not yet been circumcised, according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. You hear that? Unless you're circumcised, you cannot be saved. Baptism, very nice. You've got to be baptized. Yes, yes, yes. But you've got to be circumcised. You're supposed to be circumcised beforehand. But I hear some of you got baptized. Okay, fine. You get circumcised. You keep kosher. Then you might have a chance. Okay, so this is critical to understand. This is called the Judaizer heresy. It adds to the gospel of, of Jesus Christ that you would be baptized and enter into the church, that you must be circumcised, keep kosher to be a complete Christian, to be saved. Paul, of course, and Barnabas argued with them. So then they sent them to Jerusalem to figure out the answer because no one agreed. You've got Paul and Barnabas saying one thing. You've got these guys who came from Jerusalem, Judea, saying something else. So they sent them to Jerusalem and said, well, you guys go figure it out. So look what it says in verse 4. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and the elders. So you get the apostles and bishops, deacons, whoever helped them to be there at the time. And they declared all that God had done with them. But some believers, some Christians, who belong to the party of the Pharisees, right, very strict according to the law of Moses, rose up and said, and look at this, highlight this 300 times, it is necessary to circumcise them and, not just circumcise them, and to charge them to keep the law of Moses. Now, what part of the law of Moses could they keep in Antioch? Did they go offer sacrifices in Jerusalem? No. The only thing they do is the kosher laws. Okay, so these are two very important points we saw. Peter going to the house of uncircumcised and eating with them. It's circumcision and kosher laws. These are the two very important aspects of the, of the law that Jews kept while they were in a foreign land. Law of Moses. I want you to underline law of Moses and circle Moses. We're not talking about, when Paul talks about the law, He's not talking about the speed limit in Antioch. He's not talking about the, a Roman law. He's not talking about rules. He's talking about the Torah. Law is the translation in English of nomos, which is a translation in Greek of Torah from the Hebrew and the Old Testament. Verse 6, the apostles and elders were gathered together to consider this matter. Notice consider. Look at the debate. And after there had been much debate, much debate, really? Peter rose up and said, guys, remember my story about the house of Cornelius? So he says, verse 8, And God who knows the heart bore witness to them, giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us. Notice he keeps making that comparison. Just as he did to us who are circumcised and keep kosher. And he made no distinction. Look at that. No distinction, no partiality. Remember that before? Between us and them, but cleansed their hearts by faith. By faith. Now, therefore, why do you make trial of God by putting a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which near, near our fathers that we have been able to bear? But we believe that we shall be saved, Jewish Christians will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, just as they, non-Jewish Christians, will be. You see that? This is the debate that most people are totally unaware of when they read Galatians. This is the debate that Luther was either unaware of or ignored, unfortunately. Verse 12, and all the assembly kept silence, and Paul and Barnabas told them all these stories of what God did among the highlight Gentiles. Then James, James, Bishop of Jerusalem, not the guy who was martyred earlier, this is James, Bishop of Jerusalem, stood up and said, guys, we've all heard these stories before. Okay, and this is what all the prophets say. The prophets say, starting with Amos, that when the kingdom is restored, the Gentiles will flood in. By the way, this is one of the best arguments if you have any Jewish friends. <laughs> Can you tell any point in the history of Judaism when Christ, G Gentiles have flooded into to their understanding of Judaism? Yeah, it's about 2,000 years ago. Okay, So verse 19, he says, Therefore my judgment is that we should not trouble those the Gentiles who turn to God, but should write to them to abstain from the pollutions of idols and from pornea, un, uh, unlawful marriages, also possibly a reference to cult prostitutes, and from what is strangled and from blood. What is he talking about? 
These are the laws, this is in your notes, from Leviticus 18, from the Holiness Code. If you go back in the Old Testament, they had laws for God-fearers. Remember that were, there were 600,000 Israelite men plus women and children who left Egypt, plus a great mixed multitude that went with them. They had to have laws to govern them. There were God-fearers in the Exodus story. There were God-fearers standing at the foot of Mount Sinai. But guess what? Moses didn't tell them they had to be circumcised and didn't tell them they had to keep kosher. They could eat bacon. That's really critical. How can you Pharisee Christian, you Jewish Christian, say that Gentiles have to be circumcised in order to be saved because that's what the law says, when if you go back in the Torah and look, Moses himself did not say that the God-fearers had to be circumcised to keep kosher. Oh, good point, James. We didn't think about that one. So James just blows their argument out of the water based upon the Torah itself. Look at verse 22. And you can see what he's doing there. It says, for Moses is preached every Sabbath in the synagogues, right? We've got to do something to explain this of how Gentiles can come to the church without being certain to keep kosher. You've got to quote from the Torah if, you're gonna, if the confusion is over the Torah. Verse 22, then there was peace. It seemed good to the apostles and the elders of the whole church to choose men from among them and to send them to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. And they sent Judas called Barsabbas and Silas, leading men among the brethren with a following letter. This is the first conciliar document. The brethren, both apostles and elders to the brethren who are in Gentiles, who are of the Gentiles. In Antioch, it's here in Colicia. Greetings. Since we have heard some persons from us down south here in Judea have troubled you with words and settling your minds, although we did not tell them to do such things. It has seemed good to us in the summer to choose men, send them to you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, men who have risked their lives for Jesus Christ. We have therefore sent Judas and Silas, who themselves will tell you the same thing by mouth, for it has seemed good to the Holy Spirit. Notice they realize they're coming to this decision by the power of the Holy Spirit. And to us, to lay upon you no greater burden, underline that, no greater burden, we're going to see it coming up later, than these necessary things, okay? You don't need to be circumcised, you don't need to eat kosher, but here's some things you got to do, okay? You can't eat food offered to an idol. And they say, why would they do that? We'll talk about that in our third week together. You can't engage in pornea, unchastity is a, not a good translation there, uh, unlawful marriage or unlawful sexual unions. We'll talk about that when we get to our third, episode, or our third week together. And you can't eat things strangled, and you don't drink blood. This will bring peace. Farewell. Verse 30. So when they were sent off, they went down to Antioch, and they told these things, and there was peace. And there was peace. Okay? That is the background to the letter to Galatians. That I would say 99% of people who have read Galatians don't know. But if you know this... Galatians suddenly makes sense. And so here's what I want you to do for your homework this week as we close tonight. You're going to reread Acts 1 through 15. What? 15 chapters? Do you know how much time you spend doing email? Kathleen, we already talked about her sent box, right? So think about how much time you spend watching TV and who knows what. Turn off the TV for a little bit, okay? Take this opportunity this week to spend that extra time in the evening before you go to bed, maybe in the morning, reading Acts the Apostles 1 through 15, okay? And you can just kind of skim 1 through 9. But I want you to slow down in chapters 10 and 15, and I want you to carefully review the notes I've given you, along with what we did tonight. Maybe if you have time, even re-listen to our lecture tonight once or twice before next week so that you are well prepared for Galatians. Because if you feel like we're flying right now, wait till we jump into Galatians. I don't want you to drown. But if you properly prepared yourself, Galatians is going to be one of your most favorite epistles as it is mine. And we'll close with that. May God bless you. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and the Holy Spirit, both now and ever, and into ages of ages. Amen. So, take a break, or do we go right to questions? Let's go right into it. I can't help but just sort of just laugh with joy here because we were just at St. Veronica's uh, with Dr. Cutterback and he was giving this talk on hearing God's voice and uh, sort of, it, it wasn't your typical kind of like 
vocational discernment talk because it wasn't supposed to be. It was supposed to kind of shake us up and make us realize that, look, God does speak explicitly at times, right? And we see that, especially with the Holy Spirit being poured upon uh, the Gentiles here. So no doubt there are moments where things are crystal clear to a certain extent. And yet, look at sort of this adventure that Peter still has to go through. I mean, I can't wrap my mind around it. He's already seen Christ resurrected. He's already experienced Pentecost. And yet, still in his life, there's moments where he's got to think about this, go, well, this making me scratch my head about this. <laughs> the point I'm trying to make here is that God's calling us to a life of adventure, not of perfect black and white certitude. And uh, I, I don't know about you guys, but it's certainly been made very clear following this really exciting story of uh, Peter. So thank you, Father Sebastian. Okay, so here we go. We've kind of got a whole list of questions stocked up here, so we'll start tackling them. So William's asking, they were speaking in tongues before baptism. So when Protestants make a commitment of faith, that is similar to what happened with the centurion uh, Gentiles? I just want to make sure. So we're not talking about languages or tongues that you see in the modern charismatic thing. Is that what you're talking about? We're not talking about that. What was the question again? I think he is talking about that. So they were speaking in tongues before baptism. Uh, So when a Protestant makes a a commitment of faith, is that similar to what happened uh, to the century? All right. So nothing happens to you, but by the power of the Holy spirit. Okay. When you are drawn to the father, through Jesus Christ, it is by the power of the Holy Spirit. So someone who comes and preaches to somebody or says something to somebody who then decides to become a Christian as a result, that was by the power of the Holy Spirit. That was the Holy Spirit coming into someone's life. The fact that the individual was able to accept and hear the preaching of the word was by the power of the Holy Spirit. This is all by the power of the Holy Spirit. Uh, often we think uh, simply of, you know, well, the baptism, that's when you get the Holy Spirit. And then, you know, but everything in our life is by the power of the Spirit. It's by the power of the Spirit. And there are special moments in our Christian walk, which are special moments of a gift of the Holy Spirit. But now, that, so the speaking in languages here before uh, baptism, power of the Holy Spirit. Now, we don't have time tonight to talk about it. The idea of speaking in tongues or speaking in languages, but meaning speaking in tongues, meaning some sort of a incomprehensible babble thing. That is a recent thing in Christian history. It starts with a sect of called heretical Seventh-day Adventists by even the Seventh-day Adventists uh, in down and on Azusa street in Los Angeles in the early part of last century, and then spread throughout Protestantism. And then as you even see them on Catholics today, that's for another lecture. We don't have time to deal with it tonight. Uh, but don't confuse that with what we're seeing here in Acts. In Acts, in the New Testament, when we're speaking in languages, this is the special gift of languages that we see in missionary work still to today, where people are able to speak a language or speak their own language and others understand it in their own language for the sake of the forwarding of the gospel. And that's what you saw there at the Pentecost. You have all these people there who speak different languages, and they're able to speak, and everyone is able to understand them. Peter and the apostles there hear these, this great mixture of individuals that are Gentiles all speaking in language, and they're understanding it. So what's going on here? This is a gift of the Holy Spirit. That is the sign to them that the Spirit has descended upon the house of Cornelius just as it had upon the apostles at Pentecost, which means that in God's eyes, there is no distinction between someone who eats bacon for breakfast and someone who doesn't. There's no distinction in God's eyes between someone who's circumcised and not circumcised. That's the point that Peter was making there. And so therefore, why can't we baptize these guys? Can anyone forbid water for baptizing them? And you you get a little window into the question and the debate that was happening up to that point. And up to that point, those who, who said, no, we cannot baptize them until they've been circumcised, had still controlled and won the day in the arguments up until we get to the House of Cornelius, and of course, when we get to the story in of the Council in Acts 15. So connected with this, and I think you've answered it, so you can just, again, say a quick yes or no for Kevin here. He's asking, Gentiles are exempt from circumcision and kosher laws, 
but are Jews still bound by them even if they become Christian? We'll talk about that next week when we talk about Galatians and Romans. The answer is they are not. Paul talks about that in Romans 7. For a quick answer, if you want to go to your study, Romans chapter 7, Paul makes his argument there that logically then, if salvation is not by circumcision kosher laws, then there's no reason for a Jewish Christian to be circumcised and keep kosher either. If they want to, to be all things to all men, fine. If they want to continue to be able to evangelize their family, fine. But don't think it's going to save your soul or don't be doing it to save your soul because if you do, then that's heresy, as he says in Galatians. Uh, Ernie, did you still have a question? I do. Cornelius, uh, was he? did he know about Jesus Christ and maybe his resurrection? And so that's why the Holy Spirit went to him, and he was ready. No, it sounds. It is interesting, Ernie. It sounds like it sounds like there must have been some basic information that Cornelius had, because he's he's part of the Jewish community by extension. He's also a Roman soldier, so he's got to have heard about some of the stuff that went on in in Jerusalem and maybe the crucifixion of Jesus. He may have heard some of that stuff. It's interesting. Peter says. In Acts chapter 10, verse 36, he says, You know the word which he sent to Israel, preaching good news of a peace by Jesus Christ. So he seems to allude to a possibility there that Peter's expecting that they have some basic information that there's Jesus of Nazareth is sent by God to save them. So then Peter begins to now expound and explain that and preach the gospel to them. But more than that's all we really know. That's that little line there, you know, he says, which means as far as maybe we think, it might just be Peter's style of speaking. But it seems to imply, and it wouldn't be surprising, that Cornelius and his household have heard some stories about this new sect of Judaism that is arising and that they're, they're, they're called Nazareans and they followed this Jesus of Nazareth and things like that. Okay. Um, we've got one from Robert here. He's asking, wasn't the baptism of the Ethiopian eunuch the first baptism of a non-Jew? Interesting question. I wish we had a whole study on Acts. Maybe we can do that next time, Andy. When you're following Acts, you want to look at Acts chapter 1, verse 8, where Luke gives us kind of the layout of his plan of his book. Jesus says to the disciples in chapter 1, verse 8, You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem. Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Okay? So you're certainly right, whoever was, was asked the question. There is a, a flow. We're seeing that movement. But this is an Ethiopian eunuch who is reading the book of Isaiah. We don't know that whether he's Ethiopian or he's a Jew from Ethiopia. He's an official of the court of Kandike, the which is a title for the queen of Ethiopia at the time. <clears throat> like Pharaoh is a title for king of Egypt. So who is this guy? Is he a, a Gentile background? Maybe. If he is, he's a proselyte. He's a convert to Judaism. The point of the story there is to show that anyone of God's people, even one who is a eunuch, who is castrated, which is in the book of Isaiah, in the, in the Old Covenant, they could not enter into the temple. But Isaiah's good news is, in the New Covenant, God's people will be converted, they will, be, they will uh, have a, a pure heart, and even the eunuch will be able to enter into the temple, into the kingdom of God. He says also the Gentile. So the, the eunuch there, that's the point of it, what he's trying to say there. Okay. Okay. We've got another question from Sister Mary Francis. She asks, the things that Gentiles had to do, we don't do, like eating blood sausages. Why is that? <laughs> so... What about bratwurst? I love bratwurst. I'm sure someone's saying that. All right, so what we have here, these are regulations given to bring peace to the church in the period in which Moses is still read in the synagogues. The definitive declaration of the council is that a Gentile does not need to be circumcised to keep kosher to be saved. That's the declaration, the theological doctrinal declaration. How are we going to work out another problem? That is, how are we going to bring peace to the church? Where you have this split between these Gentile Christians and Jewish Christians. Well, you Gentile Christians, you're going to stop eating food offered to idols. We're going to talk about this in our last week. 
you're going to not engage in sexual unions, which would be contrary to the Torah. We'll talk about that again in our third week. And you're not going to, and here's what to the kosher law as well, you're not going to drink blood or eat an, a strangled animal, which is the same problem. You have the blood coagulated in the veins. Why is this? Because the law says you cannot do those things, and your Jewish Christian brethren who are sitting there in the church with you are offended by this. And so these are the four laws that were given in by Moses for the God-fearer. They could not participate in pagan sacrifice. They could not participate in unlawful unions. They could not drink blood, and they could not eat an animal improperly butchered. Those are the four laws given in the Holiness Code for the God-fearer, not only for the, Gen- the Israelite, but for the sojourner living among them. That's in the Holiness Code. And so James quotes those four, and this brings peace because suddenly it turns the lights on for everybody in the debate. Wait a minute. The Holiness Code, the most sacred part of the Torah, gives us laws about a sojourner, God-fearer, living within our community, and it doesn't say they have to be circumcised or keep kosher. Now, it doesn't solve all the problems. What they did at the council is simply solve the initial question. Does a Gentile have to be circumcised and keep kosher to be saved? And the answer was no. So James says, James, Paul, Barnabas, Peter, they all say the same thing. But James says, but we've got to do something We've got to write to them and tell them there are four things they have to abstain from. Otherwise, we're going to continue to have trouble. And that brings peace to the church. Okay? We'll talk a little bit more about that uh, next week as well and in the third week. But, yes, you can eat bratwurst if you want. Just don't think that eating bratwurst will give you the life of the animal from which the blood came, which is what they would have thought back. Okay. Esther's asking, what's the hierarchical relationship between James and Peter? Was Peter kind of the second leader of the church while James was alive? Okay, so a little note there. Today, the average Christian doesn't really have a good grasp on ecclesiology. Here's the basics of ecclesiology. What's the highest ranking individual in the church? A bishop. A bishop. There is no difference sacramentally between a cardinal, a bishop, an archbishop, a metropolitan, bishop of Rome. They're all bishops. Bishop, 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 bishop. No difference. They're all bishops. But they do have administrative, there is an administrative hierarchy, which those titles distinguish, that have developed throughout the history of the church. Okay? In the early church, in the early church, you had the apostles. And the apostles, as I mentioned, were, would go around from city to city as best as they could. Some were married, Peter and others, so they didn't travel very far. But Paul, an apostle, he's, you know, he's constantly on the run. They were missionaries. They were spreading the gospel. Jesus had said to them, you go out and preach the gospel to all nations. But as they preached the gospel in every city, you didn't expect that all the Christians in that little church that was established, then would they go out and become apostles? <laughs> It'd be called chaos, right? No one would stay where they were put. So they would establish a community of believers within Antioch or Ephesus, and then they would leave there, governing them, a resident apostle, which was not called an apostle, really. He was called an episcopus, an overseer. And there are tons of linguistic evidence in Acts that the early church understood the, the episcopus and the, the apostolos on equal standing as far as within the church, although the apostle was, would go around and establish these churches. Okay, So in the early church here in Acts, we hear about that early, early stage. We have apostles. We've got also we'll see some bishops later on. You have deacons governing individual churches with the bishops. And this individual James is mentioned in Acts. The first time he's mentioned is in Acts, Acts chapter 12. In Acts chapter 12, you hear about James, the death of James, the son of Zebedee, up in verse 2. Don't confuse that with the James we're talking about right now. Then you hear about the other James, Bishop of Jerusalem, in chapter 12, verse 17. Peter's about to leave Jerusalem. The persecution is getting too hot, so he's going to take off for a while. 
because they're looking for him. He and they're looking for the leaders of the church. So Peter just got out of prison, escaped by the hand of an angel. So he goes to the house of John Mark, and there he tells the local Christians there in that group, he says, look, I'm getting out of here, and t- tell James and the brethren. You see that in verse 17? It says, tell this to James and the brethren. That's James, Bishop of Jerusalem. Next time we see him is in chapter 15 of the council. Who is this James? It's a little bit of a, a question. We know he's James, Bishop of Jerusalem. He's a very important character in the early church. He's also called brother of the Lord. He seems to have had some relationship to the family of Jesus. Is he James the lesser? The other James of the 12? We don't know. Some fathers of the church thought so. Some didn't think so. It doesn't really matter too much. He's a very important apostolic character in the early church, and he's there governing the church in Jerusalem. When the apostles gather together, imagine the 12 originally gathering together, or five or six of the apostles gather together. Peter is one of the 12 one of the apostles. Peter gets up and speaks first. He has a place of honor, just like he did at Pentecost. And just when they chose a a replacement for Judas, Peter stands and speaks among them. He's the spokesman for them. But he, he talks to them all. There's a conciliar aspect here. And they all agree, and then they all decide to replace Judas with Matthias. And then you see the same thing here in Acts 15. Peter stands up. He says, look, guys, after they debated for a while, he stands up and says, look, Here's what happened to me. This is what I think. And then Paul and Barnabas say, yeah, not only that, but you know what happened to us when we were in Derby and Lister? Let me tell you some stories of what God did to uncircumcised, unkosher Gentiles. And then when they're done, the crowd's listening, thinking, we've heard these stories before, guys. James stands up and says, okay, guys, we've all heard this before. We've heard these stories. We've heard how God first visited the house of Cornelius through Simon. And look, this is what all the prophets said was going to happen. And then James gives his opinion. They all give their opinions, their declarations, their their solutions to the problem. And Peter, Paul, and Barnabas say, we don't need to have them be circumcised to keep kosher. James says, we don't, that's right, we don't need to have, but we do have to do something, guys. We got to come up with a solution here because There's confusion. People think that the Torah commands us to circumcise and and, and keep them to be circumcised and keep kosher. But let's look at this a little closer. And so he quotes from the Holiness Code, which for the most part basically solves the problem. It says, look, the, the, the law does not say we need to circumcise and cause to keep kosher a God feared one among us. Let's put that aside and let's tell them what they they should do to bring peace and harm into the communities. And then that was agreed upon by all of them. So they, what do they rank? I mean, yes, Peter is the highest ranking among the apostles. He's one of the apostles, but James is very important in the early church. Paul is very important. You remember in the church on the feast day of Peter, we saw Peter and Paul together, right? Uh, So as we read through the text here, when we get into Galatians next week, we're going to come up with this again. Paul's going to have to deal with this issue of the authority of the apostles in Jerusalem. And we're going to talk about it there. So if what I said just now didn't answer it, hold on to that a bit. And we'll, we'll definitely get to that again next week. Father Sebastian, thanks so much for your time. If uh, maybe we could receive a blessing from you and then we'll close here. The blessing of the Lord is mercy be upon you through his grace and love for mankind at all times, both now and ever and into ages of ages. Amen. Amen. Christ is risen. Indeed, he is risen. Amen. We hope you enjoyed this presentation from the Institute of Catholic Culture. If you'd like to learn more about the mission of the Institute and how you may become a part of this important work, please visit our website at www.instituteofcatholicculture.org or call us at 540-635-7155. And may the glory of Christ Church be ever more manifest upon the earth. St. John the Evangelist, pray for us.